Welcome back to the class and to those of you watching by video. This is session two of the course on spiritual gifts. In our first session, we talked about God having a calling for our life. In fact, God having two callings for our life. The first being salvation. God first calls us to himself. And we have a relationship with him, a personal relationship, where he becomes not only our savior, not only our Lord, but our friend. And that friendship lasts not only during this life, but on into eternity. And the second calling is once saved, we're called to service. We are called to help other people, to give our lives so that other people have a much better life. And primarily within the church, but certainly in our day-to-day -day life as well. In session two here, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the spiritual gifts. Now we're going to go through them in much greater detail later. So this is just a brief sketch of what the gifts are. The first thing I should tell you is nobody knows how many gifts there are. There's no agreement. Some people say, eh, there's eight gifts. Others say, mm, 17. Others say 19. I say 21. I didn't make that number up out of the air. Those are the, that's the number of the gifts actually listed in scripture. I have listed no other gifts that uh, might be one that others add to it. I've heard of 23 gifts and 25 gifts. My own church, Willow Creek Community Church, teaches two gifts, creative communication and craftsmanship that I don't find in the Bible. But they believe that those are uh, things that God has used at our church in a very powerful way. The answer is only God knows how many gifts there are. The one thing we do know is that there are spiritual gifts because the Bible tells us so. I want you to think back uh, to when you were a child and it was Christmas morning. Remember the excitement you felt? You remember the anticipation as a child of getting up and seeing what's under the tree? What presents did I get? I remember as a young child waking up with my two brothers. We slept in the same room. My grandparents were over, my mom and dad, and we had to stay in the room until we were called and we could come out. And we had a long hallway that led to our living room. And back in those days, I being much older, we did not have video cameras, cell phone cameras, things like that. We had these old eight millimeter cameras where they had four bright lights on the front you could hardly see as you came down the hall. So we'd come running down and those lights would be going and we'd be running into the walls, but eventually we'd get out to the living room and the Christmas tree and we couldn't wait to unwrap the presents and see what it is. Well, God has given you a gift, a spiritual gift. And there should be some excitement that you feel because God purposely chose that gift for you. Much like you go out and you spend time selecting a gift for uh, your parents, your siblings, your friends, God knew exactly the gift to give you. And that gift will last you throughout this lifetime it will not last into the eternity because we'll be with Jesus. We'll be with God. We'll be with the Holy Spirit. We don't need the gift then. We have everything we need. Spiritual gift is a huge part of your calling. All right, I don't know that I could give a percentage, but if I was just gonna guess, not biblically based, I'd say 80% of the reason you're here is based on what your spiritual gift is. And you give your gift away to other people. And that's the exciting part. 
When I was young, I never believed that little phrase that it's better to give than to receive. I don't know, I was pretty much excited about the receiving part. But now that I'm older and I'm a parent, I know how excited I am to watch the excitement in the eyes of those I've given a gift to. And to know that they recognize that I took them into my heart. And out of my love for them, I chose a gift, much like God has done for you. Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, one of the four passages that I mentioned as the main uh, discussion on spiritual gifts in the Bible, there is actually a definition of a spiritual gift. Not many places in the Bible does the Bible define a specific term. One that comes to mind is Hebrews 11.1, 1, where it defines faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's a definition of faith. If you would look in 1 Corinthians 12 down to verse 7, almost everything you need to know about spiritual gifts is in this verse. Not everything. I said almost everything. But it is a definition of spiritual gifts. So listen to it and then I'm going to break it down just a little because we're going to go through this in much more detail later. Paul writes in verse 7, Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now in there, there are some key elements to spiritual gifts. It says, now to each one. Every believer has a spiritual gift. You have at least one because it says here, to each one. So you know you have at least one. Some people may have more than one. No one has all 21 gifts except for Jesus Christ. So if you think you're Jesus Christ, you have 21 gifts and they're going to come and lock you up in the funny farm, in the psychiatric ward. But you have a gift. And what is the gift? Here's the definition. The manifestation of the Spirit. Manifestation is a big word, but what it mainly means is the revealing of the Holy Spirit, the appearance of the Holy Spirit. It's when the Holy Spirit chooses to make himself known. Now, we've never seen the Holy Spirit. We're not going to see the Holy Spirit. But it's much like the wind. You don't see the wind, but you see the evidence of the wind. You see the trees blowing. You can feel it on your face. You can watch the wind push down some sailboats as they go on the water. You see the ripples on the water. We never see the Spirit, but we see the effect of the Holy Spirit. And it's that effect that's brought about by the spiritual gift. Now, what I'm about to say is the most important thing I'm going to say the entire time. So I hope you're paying attention. The spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. The spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit. He's the gift. When you came to Jesus Christ, at that very moment, the Holy Spirit came to indwell within you. And he remains with you throughout your life. And I believe that the reason that the tribulation will get so bad is that at the moment that we are taken away in the rapture, the Holy Spirit is taken too. And there is no restraint on earth because the Holy Spirit is gone. And then evil can have its way in the world. Now, there are many beliefs on that. I'm just sharing my own. But what I can tell you is the Holy Spirit indwells you. And when the Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, it means the Holy Spirit will never leave you 
never forsake you, with you always, living within you, your partner. He is the, the uh, earthly presence of God within you. God is sitting on his throne. Jesus Christ is at his right hand, but it's the Holy Spirit that lives within you. So the gift is the Holy Spirit. Well, what about all the other things? What about teaching and, and what about uh, discernment and wisdom and where do they come from? Have you ever seen a diamond? Either a picture or you've seen the diamond yourself. Those of you who are married and are women, you can look at your hand and you can see the diamond. A diamond has different facets to it. There's like a little uh, diamond shape, which is why it's called a diamond. And there are many of them that appear around this one central stone. The facets of the diamond are like the facets of the Holy Spirit. So when you hold that diamond up in the air, that's the Spirit. The diamond is beautiful, the spirit is beautiful, but the teaching is just the one little facet on this side of the diamond. All right, the encouragement is this one, the leadership is this one. All around the diamond are different facets of the Holy Spirit, and he makes himself visible through ministry. And when we say, my spiritual gift, what we're really saying is, how does God tend to work through us to impact other people? He can actually work through you in any way. He's God. I mean, do you think if you're at a party and you're the only Christian there and everybody else is interested in spiritual things, God is going to say, oh, gee, if I only had somebody there with the gift of evangelism, then I could share the gospel. I don't think so. I think God's going to say, hmm, there's my servant right there. And at this moment, I am going to show up through that person, speak through their mouth, and share the gospel. Now, that probably doesn't happen all the time because that's not your gift. For me, how do I know my gift is teaching? I know because regularly I see the effects of the Spirit. Someone will come up to me and say, boy, when you said those words, you were talking just to me. I wasn't talking to just that person. I might not even have known that that person was in the room. It was the Holy Spirit who said, I'm going to talk to that person. That person needs to hear this message. And this has happened to me so many times that I know it's God working through me to impact other people. And it was an exciting uh, discovery for me that among all those spiritual gifts, this was the one that God chose to gave, give me. It gives me great pleasure, great joy to use the gift. But it also is a big challenge to remember it's not me. It's God. It's God working through me. As a man, as a human, there's a big part of me that wants to take credit. And I have to constantly remember, it wasn't my clever words. It wasn't my wonderful illustration. It was the Holy Spirit who decided to show up in a powerful way and touch a life. And that is something that you could not give me enough gold in the world. It is such a joyful thing. Now, if you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, this is one of the other passages I mentioned as a main passage. There is a section in here that's very important about spiritual gifts and a constant reminder to those of us uh, who may not be using our gift as we should or may not be aware of what our gift is. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 10. 
each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That's a powerful couple of verses there. Basically, he says, use your gift. Don't squander it. Don't be like the uh, parable of the talents and the one who dug a hole and buried it in the ground and never used it, never took the risk. Use your gift. And the part that you should remember is you're accountable. One of the reasons I like that I only have two gifts, I have teaching and knowledge, is I'm only accountable for teaching and knowledge. If I have five or six gifts, I'm accountable for a lot more. I want to just focus on the things that God has given me knowing that someday I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say, first, what did you do with my son? Did you accept him or reject him? The second question, what did you do with all that I gave you, including your gifts? And you will give an account. The Bible says so. So as this verse says, use your gift. Now there is no place in the Bible where it gives a uh, division of gifts. It gives a categorization, All right, These are in this form, these are in this form. But the closest place it comes is in verse 11. If anyone speaks, he should speak as though he's speaking the very words of God. So one of the categories might be those that involve speaking. And then if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. So another category of gifts might be serving. But there's no agreement on that. The only reason we use categories is so that our finite mind can understand something that is infinite. We cannot possibly understand all that is involved with spiritual gifts. But to help make sense out of it, it's helpful for us to put the spiritual gifts into categories. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. And along with some friends, we put the spiritual gifts into a category that is aligned with our body and different parts of our body. Not biblical. Only meant to help understand how the gifts function. And one of the reasons we chose the body is because Paul uses the body as a metaphor for the church. He uses it as an analogy for how the uh, church functions that it's one unit, but it has different parts. And those different parts have to depend on each other. And they're different, they're not the same. But they all have to work together for the health of the body. And we thought, that's a pretty good analogy. Paul's a pretty smart guy. So let's use that to help us understand the gifts. So, to give you a brief overview, I'm gonna use the body. And we'll start with the head with the mind, with the brain. There are certain gifts that you might associate with what our brain does. It thinks, it plans. It is the central organ of our body in order to think and make decisions. So here are a couple of gifts that might be related to the brain. And I am not gonna go into these in detail, but as I share with you, you might want to start thinking, how does God show up in my life? Not, what do I do well? That's your abilities. But, 
how does God tend to reveal himself when I serve other people? Is there a way that I tend to see God show up? So, one is administration. Administration is charting the course. It is not leadership. Leadership is setting the destination. The administration is saying, this is how we're going to get there. A second one associated with the brain is faith. Faith is something we should all have. But there are some people who have a high degree of faith to the point that only God could be giving them that faith. They believe totally, completely, 100% that what God says, God will do. And then there's the gift of knowledge. Knowledge is not just knowing a bunch of stuff, having a bunch of information. It is God giving you information from the Bible. It is Him giving you a wealth of life experiences upon which you can draw at just the right time to illustrate a point. And that's an exciting gift. Another one is wisdom. Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. It is coming together as a group. Everybody's trying to figure out a decision and somebody says, I think we should do this. And everyone else goes, wow, that's the answer. That's what we should do. Now that person probably didn't think in their own mind about it. God implanted that. And then the group came together in unity. So those are the ones associated with the brain. Now let's go down to the eyes. What do the eyes do? The eyes see. Sometimes they see things people, other people don't see. And that's what we mean by these spiritual gifts. One of them is discernment. Discernment means the person can look at you and they can see, are you telling the truth or lying? Is your motive good or is it evil? And it is a wonderful gift to protect the church so that if the wolf comes in with the sheep, the person with discernment can say, you are not a believer and can protect the church. The other one is leadership. Leadership is having a vision. God gives you a sense of this is what we should do. And you can cast that vision in a powerful, articulate way so that people go, yeah, that would be exciting. And then the administrator comes along and says, here's how we'll get there. Those are the ones associated with the eyes. The ones with the mouth, prophecy. Prophecy is a gift that in the Old Testament we see not many people with that gift are liked by other people. Why? Because sometimes they have to say hard things. It is when God gives you a message and you must communicate it of encouragement, of telling people what is going to happen, or of warning people of what they must stop doing. People with the gift of um, prophecy don't get invited to a lot of parties because others don't like to hear the truth. But it's very important to tell it. Teaching is taking the truth of the Bible and communicating it in such a way that people understand it and apply it to their lives. It's someone who looks at a certain scripture and says, here's a principle. I'm going to communicate the two people. And they go, yeah, I get it. And then they take it and they use it in their life. Uh, the third gift is the gift of tongues, which is associated with interpretation. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these two right now, because as we know, these types of gifts that we associate with the charismatic movement, those are highly controversial in the church. Personally, I believe the gifts exist. I would rather believe that God can do whatever God can do. However, 
We should take God's warning seriously not to misuse these gifts. So we'll speak of those later. Then there is the gift of intercession. Now we should all intercede. We should all pray. But there are some people who are prayer warriors. They love to pray. Right now, I have three people who are among my nearest and dearest friends who are praying for you and for me and for the people watching. Every time I go out and teach, I ask them, please pray. Please pray these specific prayers. And they love to pray. I can't say I love to pray. Prayer is a challenge for me. I sometimes have a hard time praying. It's an area that God needs to work on in my life. But for some people, they just love, give me some prayer requests and I'll get alone in a room and I'll pray. Those are the gifts of the mouth. Now how about the gifts of the heart? What would be associated with those? Well, one would be the gift of encouragement. And some call it the gift of exhortation. Now, encouragement does not mean coming alongside a friend and going, hey, way to go. That was really a nice song you sang. That's not the gift of encouragement. It's somebody who can sense that another believer is struggling in their faith. And they come alongside that believer and they walk with them for a while and they encourage them, stick to the path. Don't wander. It will be good. And they stay with them until they confess, they repent, and they come back to walking with God. Gift of hospitality is also a gift of the heart. Doesn't mean that you are, you know, Martha, Martha Stewart and you can put together a wonderful meal and you have a beautiful home. It means you create an atmosphere in your home where spiritual conversations can take place. People feel comfortable about talking about God and spiritual things. Another gift is mercy. Mercy is best seen by the story of the Good Samaritan, who didn't walk by the person who was injured on the road, but showed compassion and came alongside, and even went above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that person was okay, and did it willfully. Uh, willingly and joyfully. Shepherding is the final gift associated with the heart. It is the person who loves to take care and nurture of a group of Christians. Many pastors have the gift of shepherding. Many small group leaders have the gift of shepherding. They're the ones who, like a shepherd, shows you where this is a good part of scripture to take food. This is the wrong way, path you should take. And using the shepherd's crook, this is the way to come back to the way that God would want you to walk. The hands, well, the gift of helps. Helps is doing whatever needs to be done and doing it because you want to do it, not because you have to do it. And you know that your contribution has helped to make things successful and you would prefer to do things behind the scenes. So nobody knows. That helps. Miracles, another one of those gifts that I believe that exists, but we would associate it with charismatic, along with healing. We'll talk more about them later. The gift of giving. God has a way of blessing people financially and then giving them a heart to take what he's given them and share it with others. And do it willingly, joyfully, and again, behind the scenes. Most people who give money to help at church, help somebody who's struggling, they don't want anybody to know. If they want it to be a secret sacrifice. I know, God knows, you don't know, and I like it that way because I get blessed. And you know what? When you do that, God has a way of giving you even more blessing financially so that you can share it with others. And then finally, the gift of the feet. Apostleship is the gift where God sends you out on a mission to share a message like missionaries, 
to start a new church or to start a new ministry within your church. Apostles love to start stuff. And then once it gets started, they like to pass it along to a leader and then they like to move along and start more stuff. And then finally is the gift of evangelism. Now you and I know we should all evangelize, but there are some people who just love to share the gospel. They're constantly looking for opportunities to share the gospel with others. They have the gift of evangelism. So among all those gifts, which is yours? Among all those gifts, where do you serve? Well, that will be in our next session.